News of the Times Eccentric Sundays Sweeney Todd The Demon Barber of Fleet Street Welcome to News of the Times Eccentric Sundays, where we look at the eccentric, the quirky and notable characters that can be found in the United Kingdom. In today's episode, we are looking at the story of Sweeney Todd, fact or fiction. Our regular listeners will know of the popularity of Sweeney Todd stories as recounted in our episode looking at Penny Dreadfuls. But, like spring Jack, was the story of Sweeney Todd based on a real character? We explore the legend of Sweeney Todd in today's episode of Eccentric Sundays. We hope you enjoy the show. Sweeney Todd, the infamous demon barber of Fleet Street, is a character deeply ingrained in popular culture and folklore. But was there any truth behind the legend? Today's episode delves into the historical reality of Sweeney Todd, exploring the origins of the tale, the potential inspirations and the urban legends surrounding his existence. Who was Sweeney Todd? For those who are not familiar with the legend that is Sweeney Todd, as per the series with the Penny Dreadfuls, Sweeney Todd, or the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, tells the story of the vengeful barber who murders his clients and disposes of their bodies through a trapdoor, while his accomplice, Mrs. Lovett, uses the remains to make meat pies out of the bodies. The origins of the tale. The origins of the Sweeney Todd legend are murky, with no concrete evidence pointing to a specific individual. The earliest known mention of the character appears in a serialised story titled The String of Pearls, a Romance, which was published in 1846-1847. The story presents Sweeney Todd as a murderous barber who dispatched his victims through a trapdoor. Later episodes introduced the pie shop owner next door, Mrs. Lovett. We have gone through the Newgate calendar, prison records and court records, and there is absolutely no record of Sweeney Todd in any of the records despite a book released in the 1990s purporting that he did indeed exist. He did not, at least under this name. However, the best stories are based on real stories. Several Dickens's characters can be traced back to real personages in history and inspiration. Who could have been the inspiration for the story of Sweeney Todd? We take a look. The Inspiration Although we have not found any one specific case that could be the inspiration of the story of Sweeney Todd, there are a number of different real cases that could have helped create the legend. We look first to France, the renowned capital of fine cuisine. An often retold stories from France is our leading possible inspiration for the demon barber and Mrs. Lovett's pies. 1384. The Butcher of Ile de la Cite. The story of the Butcher of Ile de la Cite is approximately 1384, is a historical tale that continues to persist to this day. The events unfolded in the heart of Paris, on the iconic island of Ile de la Cite where a notorious butcher earned a chilling reputation for his gruesome acts. The island, known for its isolation, had bridges vulnerable to winter floods and floating ice, which had devastated the area years prior. Yet, amid this tranquillity, nestled between the streets of Rue de Marmousettes and Rue de Hermetites, stood a genial butcher and a jovial barber. 
During the years from 1384 to 1387, the butcher of Rue des Marmosettes gained widespread renown throughout France. Among his various meats, it was his savoury pâtés and meat pies that captivated the French populace. Even King Charles VI himself was said to be a fervent admirer of the butcher's culinary masterpieces. Adjacent to the butcher's establishment, the island's barber plied his trade. While his clientele extended far and wide, it was the young foreign students who held a special place in his heart, or rather, his blade. When an unsuspecting philosophy major found himself alone with the barber, a swift and fatal stroke to the jugular would send him tumbling down a chute into the shared basement with the butcher. There, the unfortunate student would meet a grisly fate, as the butcher chopped, ground and mashed him, preparing to incorporate him into the day's meat pie. The barber and the butcher favoured foreign students as their families would not realise their absence until long after they had been devoured, disappearing into the dark depths of their malevolent scheme. For years, this diabolical pair thrived, prospering from their economically prudent enterprise, their deeds went unnoticed, until the disappearance of a young German student threatened to unravel their vile operation. As the police found themselves perplexed and devoid of leads, one factor tipped the scales. The missing student's faithful canine companion. Day and night, the loyal dog barked outside the barbershop, waiting for his master's return. Eventually, the authorities deemed it necessary to investigate the source of the dog's unwavering vigilance. Within the depths of the butcher's basement, the police uncovered a grisly scene, and the damning evidence left behind by the victims. The truth was laid bare, and both the butcher and the barber faced swift justice outside the city hall, meeting their ultimate fate at the end of a hangman's noose. 1573, The Werewolf of Dole this story, again from France, with its cannibalism, could have been an inspiration of Sweeney Todd or the Wagner the Werewolf stories, also found in the Penny Dreadfuls. In the dark days of the 1570s, a wave of terror gripped the town of Dole as innocent children vanished without trace. The first victim, a young girl of ten, was discovered in a vineyard, her flesh torn asunder. Whispers spread attributing these macabre acts to the machinations of a monstrous werewolf prowling the shadowed wood. In those times, the notion of a man transforming into a ravenous wolf to feast upon the flesh of unsuspecting children held a certain plausibility. But where could this elusive creature be hiding? Enter Gilles Garnier, a peculiar and solitary figure hailing from nearby Lyon. Considered an outsider by the local populace, Garnier dwelled in the unforgiving forest north of Dole, accompanied by his wife and child, and as misfortune befell the land and an unrelenting winter ravaged the region, Garnier's plight worsened. Bereft of livestock and land, he roamed the fields in search of sustenance, his visage gaunt and wild with desperation. It was during this nadir that the devil himself crossed his path. During his subsequent trial, Gilles confessed to encountering a cloaked figure who bestowed upon him a magical ointment one that granted him the power to metamorphosize into the fearsome shape of a wolf. 
Eight days after this discovery of the initial victim, the town was shaken once more by a brazen attack in broad daylight. A young girl fell victim to the wolf's savage fury. Her throat rent and abdomen torn asunder. Witnesses unaware of the identity of the beast would later recount glimpsing Gilles feasting upon the girl's mutilated form in his lupine guise. A week elapsed before tragedy struck again, claiming the life of a ten-year-old boy as he innocently wandered through a vineyard. Like his predecessors, the child was strangled, his arms stripped of flesh, yet in a horrifying twist, both of his legs had been savagely severed. And then another week passed, and the haunting cries of a fourth victim pierced the sombre woods, a group of brave locals drawn by his anguished pleas discover Garnier in his human form, tearing the flesh from the young boy's lifeless frame. They manage to apprehend the fiend, but the boy, a mere twelve years of age, had succumbed to his gruesome fate. Accounts differ as to whether Garnier confessed willingly or was subjected to relentless torture. Regardless, his fate was sealed. Convicted of practising witchcraft, he met his end on January the 18th, 1573, engulfed by the flames of a vengeful pyre. 1580. Sawney Bean and his cannibalistic family. Regular listeners will already be familiar with this true life tale of a family living in the hills of Scotland who would waylay travellers, kill them and eat them. Estimated killings are over 1,000 people. Estimated time frame around 1580s for roughly 25 years. Information regarding this case comes from the Newgate Calendar, which began publishing in 1782. This story directly involved King James VI of Scotland, later to be the King James I of England. In essence, the saga of Stony Bean and his family tell the tale of a family living in a cave outside of Galloway in Scotland during the reign of James VI of Scotland. They did not interact with others and kept themselves to themselves. Sawney and wife's eventual quite extensive family of eight sons, six daughters and eighteen grandsons and fourteen granddaughters made their living robbing and murdering. According to the story, anyone they murdered was then brought back to their cave, dismembered and eaten. Excerpt from the Newgate Calendar, 1782. By this bloody method and their living so retiredly from the world, they continued such a long time undiscovered, there being nobody able to guess how the people were lost that went by the place where they lived. As soon as they had robbed and murdered any man, woman or child, they used to to carry off the carcass to the den, where, cutting it into quarters, they would pickle the mangled limbs and afterwards eat it, this being their only sustenance. And, notwithstanding they were at last so numerous, they commonly had superfluity of this, their abominable food, so that in the night times they frequently threw legs and arms of the unhappy wretches they had murdered into the sea at a great distance from their bloody habitation. The limbs were often cast up by the tide in several parts of the country to the astonishment and terror of all the beholders and others who heard of it. Persons who had gone about their lawful occasions fell so often into their hands that it caused a great outcry in the country round about. No man knowing what was become of his friend or relation if they were once seen by these merciless cannibals. 
This is recounted to have gone on for some 25 years. The area became known as treacherous, and few would travel the way if they could avoid it. Sawney and his clan are eventually captured, as recounted in the Newgate calendar. This man, who was the first that had ever fallen in their way and came off alive, told the whole company what had happened and showed them the horrid spectacle of his wife, whom the murderers had dragged to some distance, but had not time to carry her entirely off. They were all struck with stupefaction and amazement at what he related, took him with them to Glasgow, and told the affair to the provost of that city, who immediately sent to the king concerning it. The involvement of King James VI of Scotland In about three or four days after, His Majesty himself in person, with a body of about four hundred men, set out for the place where this dismal tragedy was acted, in order to search all the rocks and thickets that, if possible, they might apprehend this hellish crew which had been so long pernicious to all the western parts of the kingdom. The man who had been attacked was the guide, and care was taken to have a large number of bloodhounds with them, that no human means might be wanting towards their putting an entire end to these cruelties. The bloodhounds found the entrance to the cave where Shawnee Bean and his family are hiding. What they find is unexpected. Now the whole body, or as many of them as could, went in, and were all so shocked at what they beheld that they were almost ready to sink into the earth. Legs, arms, thighs, hands and feet of men, women and children were hung up in rows like dried beef. A great many limbs lay in pickle, and a great mass of money, both gold and silver, with watches, rings, swords and pistols, and a large quantity of clothes, both linen and woolen, and an infinite number of other things, which they had taken from those whom they had murdered, were thrown together in heaps, or hung up against the sides of the den. To us, here at News of the Times, we think this would certainly have been part inspiration for the character of Sweeney Todd. Sawney versus Sweeney. Not so very different. 1825. Rue de la Harpe murders. Once again we are in France with the urban myth of the barber and the butcher, very similar to the original story from France above. France's great master detective, Joseph Fouché, reportedly had documented a series of crimes he had worked on, including a crime that involved a barber and a butcher. However, we are unable to trace this book, and we cannot but wonder if he did not take the old legend of this from history, changing some of the details slightly and having it taking place at the Rue de la Harpe in Paris. From here, this story appears in the Telltale magazine of 1825. The Penny Dreadful series of Sweeney Todd was published in 1845. 1824. Alexander Pierce, known cannibal. This story from 1824 took place in the renowned penal colony for English prisoners at Sarah Island on Makiri Harbour. Alexandra Pierce, with seven others, attempts to escape. Things do not go well with little provisions and a very inhospitable terrain. They do, however, have a small axe with them. The story is recounted in the Hobart Times. For eight days they subsided upon this noxious decoction. Three of them resolved to return. Chains, floggings and labours were preferable to that living deaths of misery. The physical condition of Dalton did not permit him to go far homeward to the jail. His faltering steps were numbered. 
Cornelius and Brown succeeded in reaching the island prison. Their exhausted frames soon lay in a felon cemetery. Their five companions at large still journeyed eastward. Some wild berries gave them a nauseous substance for three days. When the resources failed, they took off their jackets made of kangaroo skin, roasted and devoured them. Approaching the rapid stream of the Gordon, they searched in vain for food. Already each man contemplated a meal, a crime, but dared not give utterance to the thought. At last Greenhill and Travers, in a hissing whisper, spoke of sacrifice. Pierce and Mathers were away gathering sticks and furs. Bodium was near. When the first horror was over, a consultation followed. Some would have died rather than live by cannibalism, but it was fiercely contended that all should taste, that all might share the guilt. They must all eat. They ate, and there remained but the bare bones of a vulture's feast. The eye of the least villainous quailed as it turned upon the others. This must be the next victim. Travers and Greenhill held him, while the butcher, Greenhill, performed the task. Upon such fare they made a long distance. Travers now lingered behind, for his feet were sore. He would soon die. Why should not others live by his death? Greenhill's axe made another swing. For two whole days and nights in this dreadful watch maintained, the brains of Greenhill reels, his eyes close, and they open no more. The victor eats the murderer. This fiendish repast lasted four days. Pierce, after some adventures, is eventually captured and sent back to prison, where he is violently flogged. Later, his shirt is stolen. Pierce is flogged for having lost his shirt. A new prisoner, Cox, repeatedly tempts Pierce to try another escape run. Eventually, Pierce agrees. The Hobart Times continues, but Pierce remembered Greenhill and slew the unfortunate Cox. The military had left and the cannibal dragged the carcass of Cox to their dying fire. There he remained another day. Remorse or fear mastered him. He signalled the schooner Waterloo, surrendered and was taken to the settlement, brought to Hobart Town, he made a confession of his crimes and paid the last debt to society upon the gallows. And so ends the story of Alexander Pierce, the first felon to be executed by the new Supreme Court in Van Diemen's Land, and the first confessed cannibal to pass through that legal system. Pierce was not a strongly built man standing only about five foot three inches or 1.6 meters. The Hobart town described him as laden with the weight of human blood and believed to have banqueted on human flesh. True, there had been body parts of Thomas Cox found in Pierce's pockets, but one can only speculate whether it was circumstance which drove Alexandra Pierce to such a horrific act. It was reported that some of Pierce's last words were, Man's flesh is so delicious, it tastes far better than fish or pork, but we have been unable to substantiate this. 1829, Burke and Hare. Closest to home, the story of Burke and Hare could very well have been a partly inspirational the attested seventy murders of Burke and Hare took place in Scotland. Cadavers were at a premium for medical students and medical science for the purpose of dissection. This was due to the sharp reduction of execution rates from changes in the law. Burke and Hare discovered this gap in the market and made the most of it. Burke and Hare are often remembered erroneously as being resurrectionists, people 
who would go to graveyards, exhume and steal bodies. And that has become a folk tale. The truth is, Burke and Hare instead preyed upon unfortunates who ended up in their path. They then tended to ply them with drink, smother them, and then package them up and drop them off to Dr. Knox, an eminent doctor and anatomy lecturer of his day, who asked no questions and regularly paid ten pounds a body. The bodies would be dissected, considered an exceptionally gruesome ending, even after death. 1835, Pierre Riviere. Pierre Riviere's case from France in 1835 made headlines. Pierre Riviere was a young French peasant who committed a notorious act of matricide in the village of saint Colomb in France on the June 3rd, 1835. He brutally murdered his mother, sister and brother with a sickle. Riviere was subsequently arrested and his case gained significant attention and scrutiny. During his trial, Riviere claimed that he had been tormented by his family, leading to his violent outburst. He argued that he was driven to commit the murders due to long-standing family conflicts and abuse. Riviere's case sparked debates about mental illness, criminal responsibility, and the treatment of criminals in the French legal system. Although there was no question of cannibalism in this case, it did have a very strong impact in France and made the papers in England. 1845, the doomed polar expedition. The 1845 polar tragedy refers to the ill-fated Arctic expedition by Sir John Franklin, a renowned British explorer in an attempt to discover the Northwest Passage, a sea route connecting the Atlantic and the Pacific through the Arctic. Franklin set sail from England in 1845 with two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, and a crew of 129 men. Unfortunately, the exhibition faced numerous challenges and ultimately ended in tragedy. The exact details of what transpired during their journey remains largely unknown, as no members of the expedition survived to provide a first-hand account. Whatever this may have had any influence is speculative only, and the timing is slightly late, but wild tales did exist of people possibly having resorted to cannibalism in lands far away. Additional urban legend. One additional urban legend is well worth mentioning. We have found no trace of the source, nor can we find any trace of the story in trial records, but it makes for an interesting possibility of an inspiration for Sweeney Todd. The story of Thomas Barber. In the Annals of Crime, the story of Thomas Barber stands as a chilling testament to the depths of human depravity. Known as the real-life barber and serial killer, Barber terrorised 19th-century England with his heinous act. Thomas Barber was born in the late 18th century and initially embarked on a seemingly normal career as a barber. However, as his life progressed, dark tendencies began to emerge. The precise details of his early life are somewhat elusive but it is believed that hardships and psychological disturbances played a role in his transformation into a ruthless killer. Between 1796 and 1801, Thomas Barber carried out a series of brutal murders, primarily targeting vulnerable young women. His victims were often lured into his barber shop, where he would incapacitate them before subjecting them to horrific acts of violence. Barber's modus operandi included dismembering his victims and disposing of their remains in various locations, leaving little trace of his crime. As the number of missing persons increased, 
suspicions surrounding Thomas Barber began to mount. Authorities launched an investigation, carefully piecing together the evidence, and eventually the mounting weight of circumstantial evidence led to Barber's arrest, and he was subsequently charged with multiple counts of murder. Thomas Barber stood trial for his heinous crimes. The courtroom proceedings revealed the shocking details of his gruesome acts, leaving the public aghast at the extent of his depravity. Despite attempts to plead insanity, Barber was found guilty and sentenced to death. So goes the tale which has been around for a long time, but we have found no supporting evidence, but it certainly fits as well as the Barber surname. Could this urban legend have been the inspiration? Sadly, we have found no evidence of Sweeney Todd, no murderous barber on Fleet Street, no record of human pies in London, as far as we are aware. But all the best tales draw inspiration from one or many sources. Which one do you think? Was it the fabled French tale that was so good it looked to have been retold several hundred years later by a self-marketing retired policeman? Or the real story of Sawney Bean and his cannibalistic clan? Or perhaps the real-life story of the werewolf of Dole? Was it Alexander Pierce and his supposed taste for human flesh? Or possibly the stories recounted of Burke and a hare feeding the dissectors? or the speculations and rumours surrounding the doomed polar expedition. We have not been able to pinpoint the urban legend of Thomas Barber, so we do not know if it came before or after publishing of Sweeney Todd in the Penny Dreadfuls. Regardless, it is something to consider when leaning your head back at the barber's for a close shave, or tucking into that meat pie. That concludes this episode of Eccentric Sundays, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. We hope you enjoyed the show. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed... We would be very grateful if you did. We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends, and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload five days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. And Wednesdays will become wicked Wednesdays, and in this series, we will be looking at some of the shocking events, bloody places and outrageous organisations of their day. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>